All right, while we get started, thank you very much for coming on this beautiful afternoon. My name is Doug Irwin. I'm a professor of economics in the economics department and co-director of the Political Economy Project. We'd like to welcome you to this debate. If you're here from Econ 22, there's a sign up in the back, and I see students have already noted that, um, so you can get your extra credit. Um, but uh, we're here to uh, uh, talk about a very interesting and uh, uh, important issue. Um, <clears throat> let me just tell you a moment uh, for a moment about the Political Economy Project. Uh, please check out our website uh, at Dartmouth, just Google us. You can also see Hank, Hank Clark, our program director. The PEP on campus sponsors uh, debates. We sponsor different classes. We sponsor uh, reading groups, all sorts of different events around the theme of politics and the economy uh, and things of that sort. And we're always happy to co-sponsor uh, these uh, events with uh, the Rockefeller Center and other entities on campus. This is actually a debate that we had planned over three years ago, uh, and it's been delayed. So we want to thank our two uh, protagonists for uh, their patience and finally uh, bringing, uh, the, getting them to come to campus, um, obviously due to COVID. But we want to sort of uh, reintroduce more debates on campus. This will be our first uh, since COVID, and it's on the topic of immigration. Um, this is uh, clearly a, a, a topic that is sort of timeless in some sense, since it uh, was important three years ago, it's important today, it'll be important in the future. Um, and of course, it's one that's politically salient, uh, and there's a lot of controversy about it as well. And so we hope our two uh, uh, discussants today, our debaters, will be able to enlighten us a little bit on the different positions taken uh, on this particular issue. So let me introduce them, tell you a little bit about our format, and then we'll uh, move forward. So first of all, on my left is uh, Brian Kaplan. He's a professor of economics at George Mason University, uh, New York Times best-selling author, prolific uh, blogger and writer. Uh, he's the author, for example, of The Myth of the Rational Voter, which was named by the New York Times as one of the best political books of the year. He has another book called uh, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, uh, another book, The Case Against Education, and most importantly for today, uh, a book entitled Open Borders, The Science and Ethics of Immigration, co-authored with Zach Weinersmith. And what's interesting about this book, it is a, a, a nonfiction graphic novel. Uh, when we were talking about this earlier, I thought a nonfiction novel is sort of a contradiction in terms, but that's the genre of books. It's not a cartoon book, but it's an illustrated book that walks us through uh, a discussion of immigration. Um, and I should add that it's received praise both uh, on all sides of the political spectrum and, and including all sides on the uh, issue of immigration. We also have with us Mark Krikorian, who is executive director of the Center of Immigration Studies in Washington, D.C., uh, and he's been executive director since 1995. Uh, the center is an independent, nonpartisan research organization uh, devoted to the study and critique of immigration policy, and it was established in 1985 to contribute to the public debate. Uh, he is well recognized for his expertise in this area. He's testified before Congress on many occasions, uh, many op-eds in uh, leading outlets. He also has appeared on television, and he's author of several books as well, most importantly for our purposes here, uh, the new case against immigration, both legal and illegal. You can check out their websites, you can check out uh, their Twitter feeds as well if you want to learn more. Um, but the way we've structured today is uh, uh, Professor Kaplan will go first, he'll speak for about 15 minutes, they'll each have opening statements of about 15 minutes. Then they'll interrogate each other for about 15 minutes as well, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A from the audience, and we have some uh, mics that we can uh, circulate throughout. So why don't we start with uh, Professor Kaplan. Thank you very much for being here. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dartmouth. I've heard you guys are really smart, so I'm going to go fast. You will need the uh, microphone. To just um, first of all, Brian, Brian, Brian. Brian. Oh, yes, of course. I've heard you guys are really smart, so I'm going to go fast. All right. Uh, this is about the fifth time I've debated Mark on immigration. He's in my book. There he is uh, with his book. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, now, I keep taking this extreme open borders position that is the resolution here. And Mark keeps telling the audience, open borders will obviously cause a ton of problems, so we obviously shouldn't do it. So why do I stick to my guns instead of just moderating? And here's the answer. Because the benefits of immigration are astronomical and the costs are tiny by comparison. All right, so what happens when we say yes? Uh, just basic fact, in case anyone didn't know, most people on Earth cannot live or work in the first world without government permission. There isn't some line where you get there and then 20 days later you get your papers. Rather, most people just have no possibility of ever getting in. 
If you don't have close blood relatives, you don't marry a US citizen, if you don't win the diversity lottery, which is about as hard as it sounds, then the answer is no, you cannot legally be here. All right, but what does happen in those cases where the US does say yes to even the lowest skill third world worker? All right, and the answer is totally clear. You can take someone who has been herding goats in Afghanistan, move him to the US, and in a week he is suddenly making five, 10, or 15 times as much money as he was making back home. How is this amazing result possible? How can you just move a person from one country to another and then see that their earnings would multiply so many times? Uh, the answer is that moving must multiply productivity by five, 10, or 15 times. Businesses in the US are not running charities. It's not like they say, oh, you need the money, here you go. Rather, they are competing with each other. The competition leads to much higher wages because productivity here is much higher than it would be in, say, Afghanistan. Now, who consumes all this extra productivity? Mostly Americans, mostly US citizens who are already here. Uh, as you might have heard, services is most of the American economy. So you can't sell Afghan restaurant meals to Americans if they're living in some other country. You've got to be right next to them to do it. Uh, what this means is that saying yes greatly enriches the immigrant, and it enriches the immigrant by allowing him to produce stuff and sell it to us. Um, there is, at this point, I will teach you the number one most important principle of economics. So what is it? The number one most important principle of economics is that the secret of mass consumption is mass production. Countries with high living standards are countries where they produce a ton of stuff. Countries with low living standards are countries where they produce very little stuff. Oh. Now, for one immigrant, the gains are hard fact. I don't think Mark would disagree, right? But there's only intellectually challenging question is this. Can we scale it? Can we scale it? Right, if we can create a million dollars by saying yes to one person, it's like, really, yeah, you raise his income by $30,000 a year for 30 years, that's about a million dollars. If we can create a million dollars just by pronouncing that one syllable word, yes, yes, you can come. Can we create $330 trillion by letting in 330 million immigrants? Could that be done? Yeah, that math is, is correct, by the way. Yeah, all right, okay. Um, this sounds impossible, like how could we possibly fit another 330 million people? That's roughly the current population of the US. Uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, the US population already multiplied by a factor of 80 since 1789. So how could it possibly be the case we can't double one more time over the course of a few decades? Uh, so why not? Why not? Why not just start saying yes, 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 yes. Each of you can come here, you can greatly multiply your productivity, and you can then go and enrich yourself by enriching us, your customers. Well, here's the thing that most people do. You just demagogue about a bunch of trivial problems. I saw in the news there was an immigrant who went and hit someone's dog with their car, so we shouldn't let immigrants in. All right. This is the kind of thing that most people say. This is the kind of stuff my dad says, right? My dad is probably the angriest critic of immigration that I know, and you can just get him off, and he'll just have a long list of very trivial but emotionally affecting complaints, which is what demagoguery is all about. Uh, but the best critics, hopefully including Mark, we shall see. The best critics will say, fine, there are enormous gains of immigration. You're right. It is remarkable that you can take a Haitian, put him on the streets of Miami, and suddenly he's making 15 times as much money as he was making back home the week before. But there are offsetting harms. And not just I saw a story on the news about someone who, an immigrant who hit somebody's dog, but serious offsetting harms. Yeah. A grave fiscal burden, cultural harm, political harm. Right? These are all things that no doubt everyone here has heard about. And in 15 minutes, I don't think I'm going to be able to completely assuage your fears, but I'm going to do my best. All right, here's the main hurdle for any serious critic. The estimated gains of immigration are massive. We're talking about something like a low estimate of a million dollars per person. And if we could let in a whole lot, we're talking about a million times the number of people we let in. Yeah, that 330 trillion 
That is not an unreasonable estimate of the lifetime gains of doubling the U.S. population through immigration. What this means is that since the gains of immigration are so astronomically large, you can't just reasonably complain a bunch of times and say, see, I win. You've got to show the harms are also astronomical. They've got to be huge for the argument against to make any sense. All right, so let's go through these main complaints. Uh, there's Milton Friedman. Do, you, do the students know about Milton Friedman, Doug? Okay. All right. Yes, uh, Milton Friedman, economist. I got to shake his hand, got him to sign his book before, sign it before he died. Uh, he had an interview where he said, quote, you cannot simultaneously have free immigration and a welfare state. All right, now underlying this is a simple story that should occur to anyone who knows basic facts. And here it is. The American welfare state pays more for idleness than many countries pay for work. When I was just in Italy, which is not that poor of a country, I was adding up the amount of money you could get during COVID to not work. And the Italians, like, mamma mia, that's a lot of money to not work. Okay, so, yeah, getting up to what? You know, like you know, $40,000 a year. All right. And therefore, the argument goes immigrants come to abuse the system, which no doubt happens sometimes. All right. But how big is this number? How bad is this problem compared to the many trillions of dollars of possible gains. Well, an important fact about the welfare state is that most of the money doesn't go to the poor anyway. It goes to the old. That is the way actually almost all welfare states work. A lot of propaganda about helping the poor when actually you are mostly spending it on old people, most of whom are not poor. All right, the upshot of this is that immigrants tend to be young, uh, even if they are low skilled, is that when people come and actually carefully add up the net fiscal effects, we're considering, all right, what are all the taxes the immigrant is likely to pay over his lifetime? What are all the services that he's likely to consume? There's almost no serious researcher finds a large negative effect. There are people who find small negative effects, people who find break even, people who find positive effects. And again, these are not people that agree with me or handpick for that purpose. I actually, when I, tr when I try to get numbers, I try to get the numbers from the most boring people I can find. People who have no other agenda, no broader interests, to say, look, I'm just going and adding up some numbers here. Right? Those are the people I would consider most reliable. All right, uh, so in my book, I talk a lot about the National Academy of Sciences estimates, but those are probably the best ones we have for now. There's plenty of others. All right, now, uh, obviously, since we haven't worked through the numbers together, the persuasiveness of what I just told you depends on whether you trust me. And why would you trust me? You don't know me, right? You just met me. All right, uh, but here's something I can tell you to at least make you wonder whether it's absurd to think that immigration actually is not a big fiscal burden, and that is that a lot of government spending is non-rival. What that means is that a lot of government spending does not depend upon population, right? So immigrants actually help to spread the cost of national defense, debt service, and so on. All right, now another common complaint is that immigrants are destroying American culture. They won't learn the language, they won't fit in. Cultural arguments are a bit harder to deal with because it's hard to know exactly what people mean by culture. But there are some pretty e easily measured things that people do talk about where we can find out what's going on. All right, so for language, this one is really easy. We can actually go and measure linguistic knowledge of immigrants and what we can see is that well over 90% of second generation Mexicans speak fluent English and this is the group that people are most likely to think is not assimilating. Uh, first generation immigrants, it is true, generally don't have fantastic English, especially if they come later in life. This has always been true. So I know Mark is going to talk about how the American engine of assimilation is broken down. Uh, I don't think so. I think rather that most of this is just an illusion generated by the fact that in the past you would get a generation of Italians and then Italian immigration would stop. Whereas we've had many generations of Spanish immigration, Spanish speaking immigration creating the illusion that sp Spanish speakers don't learn English. Rather it is first generation people have trouble learning it but their kids do. Um, we can talk more about this in the Q&A. Uh, as you might guess, there's a lot of people on the internet that don't like me very much. And one of their favorite things to say about me is, Brian is so dumb, he believes in magic dirt. All right, what is magic dirt supposed to be? Magic dirt is supposed to be that an Afghan goat herder can arrive in the US, his foot touches the soil of America, and then, ah, oh, 
he is transformed into an investment banker who speaks perfect English. All right, so I do not believe in magic dirt. I don't think that just touching the soil of the US transforms people. But I will say I believe in something that I will call magic culture. What this says is two things. First of all, you really can take an Afghan goat herder, have him show up in the US, and within a week or two, he can be a, a productive member of society. Maybe just washing dishes in an Afghan restaurant. But that's a good thing for a person to do. The dishes do need to be washed. But what's much more magical is when you look at the kids of that same Afghan goat herder. His kids grew up here. They do, in fact, learn fluent English, and they assimilate to a very high degree. Right, and last, uh, something, that I talk, something that Mark has said I talked about many times. Uh, Mark has previously said immigrants are like donuts. Do you remember this, Mark? Yes, okay, so, so it's a talking point. All right, so I'll tell you Mark's story, and then I'll tell you what's, uh, it's not wrong, it's just half the truth. All right, so he says, like, immigrants are like donuts. When you're young, like you guys, you can stuff your face with donuts all you want, and you don't get fat, and you're fine. But if you keep stuffing your face with donuts when you are 40, you will be fat and sick. All right, and Mark said, immigrants are sort of the same way. When you have a young country, it is possible to absorb a ton of immigrants without messing your country up, but when you're an older country, no longer so. When pushed, say, well, what's the difference? It's not like a country is a body. And so why would that be? And what Mark said is, we have lost our, our engine of assimilation. All right, uh, why? Well, a big part of it is that as, t as technology has improved, both communications and transportation, it is much easier for a person now to migrate to the U.S. physically but mentally stay in their home country. In 1900, if you migrate to the U.S. from Sicily, you are going to be in rare contact with people in your home country. You are basic, and you're not going to be going back very much. It was too expensive. But now a migrant can come and move to the U.S. and still barely assimilate. Uh, there's something to that. It is easier to move to another country and not assimilate now. But the flip side of this is also because of transportation and communication, it is much easier to assimilate before you move. And if you've been to any other country in the world, you might have noticed, wow, things are really Americanized here. It's hard to practice the foreign language I came to this country to practice because everyone around here speaks English. Right? And this is indeed what we, what we see, that there has been a large increase in the population of the world that already knows what the first world is like, even if they have never lived there, even if they've never been, even, even never even visited. And this is what I call pre-assimilation. People can assimilate before they arrive, and they do to a remarkable degree. All right, then, protecting American liberty. Uh, this is the most popular complaint from the Friends of Freedom. Uh, this is the Free State Project, right? Free State Project, I just had lunch with some of the Free State people. All right, so do we really want to let in a bunch of immigrants from status countries who will vote to ruin our country too? What if Venezuelans voted to destroy Venezuela? They didn't vote destroy Venezuela, but they voted for what happened, right? And if they came here, would they not go and vote for the same kind of thing? Uh, well, uh, this is one where I went over a lot of data for the book, and I'll say, look, there is a kernel of truth to the complaint. Uh, but, again, it's not just a matter of whether the problem exists at all. It's whether the problem is massive, and there is no sign that it's even big. Uh, what we can say is that non-natives are indeed more socially conservative, more economically liberal, but the difference is marginal, uh, except for the least educated. Uh, and then non-natives also have low turnout, especially the less educated. So if you are concerned about people like this voting, they actually vote very rarely. Uh, now, last point, this is something that has been discussed a lot in Scandinavia about immigration. Uh, so back in the old days when Scandinavia had hardly any immigration, they had their famous cradle-to-grave welfare states, which you may have heard about. Uh, these welfare states have been toned down in recent years, and a lot of the complaint is immigrants are coming and abusing our system, so we're not going to have it be as big as before. Uh, in any case, there's been quite a bit of research on this. Is it really true that immigrants undermine support for the welfare state? And a lot of this research comes out of Scandinavians who really don't want to find the result, but they do anyway. And they say, you know, yes, it very much seems that immigrants are undermining support for the welfare state in Sweden. Right? Uh, now, does this mean Sweden does not have a welfare state anymore? Uh, no, it has a huge welfare state, but it does seem like immigration has helped them to get it under control. If you think it's bad for the welfare state to be under control, then that is a problem with immigrants. 
On the other hand, if you think that this is a good move in the right direction, and again, it is something where the idea is that the native-born people don't like supporting outgroups, and so they have adopted a more pragmatic view. All right, now last point. Uh, the US had nearly open borders until 1921. If you know your history, you know about a few exceptions, but the exceptions were very minor, right? And during this time, it worked wonders. Out of all the debates that I've had with people at immigration, I've had trouble finding any time that even the most ardent immigration restrictionist says, well, it was a terrible mistake for the US to have immigration ever. I have yet to meet this person. I don't think Mark is one of those people, right? So there was a period that they think that immigration actually did a lot of good. Right, and of course, remember, in the 19th century, was it just immigration coming from the British Isles? It was immigration from coming from all over Europe, primarily, although also some from Asia, also a bit coming from Latin America, right? And almost anyone who looks at the record of the US will say, wow, it worked wonders. It worked wonders. Thanks to immigration, the US became the world's richest and most powerful country, and, and for a very large number of people. Right? It's not, so it's not just that a small number of people get to enjoy the good life here, but at this point, the third largest population of human beings in the world get to enjoy the good life here. Right? Like I said, even Mark agreed the last time I asked him. I assume he has not changed his mind. Uh, so Open Borders does not just have strong arguments on its side. Uh, unlike most radical ideas, it has been tried before with great success. So why not? Thank you very much. Everything you said was wrong. <laughs> I'll sit down. <laughs> um, the, uh, I wanted to uh, thank Brian for the cartoon version of myself in his book to be better looking than I am. Uh, that was a uh, gracious move. Um, and we have, in fact, done this a number of times. And I want to start with a quote from Deng Xiaoping, who in 1979 came to Washington. He was then the de facto leader of China, came to Washington for trade talks. This was a time when the um, United States was pushing the Soviet Union, some of you may remember that there was such a thing, uh, to let people emigrate. It was Soviet Jews and refuseniks, it was kind of, it was a thing at the time. And President Jimmy Carter pressed Deng Xiaoping on loosening emigration rules from China. And Deng responded, look, that's something you guys have with the Russians. There's nothing to do with us. But then he called Carter's bluff, and he said, how many Chinese do you want? 10 million, 20 million, 30 million? Uh, Carter immediately backed away. I mean, he was the second worst president in recent years, but um, knew when he uh, wanted to stop talking about something and change the subject. But Deng's question raises a basic dilemma that all developed countries that all destination countries for immigration have to face, and that is, should there be limits on immigration? Brian's presentation kind of fudged the issue, because the issue is not whether we should have more or less immigration. That's an important issue and one we should talk about. Brian's book is explicitly about unlimited immigration. Open borders, that's why it's called that. Uh, Brian thinks there should be no limits on immigration. Now, let me start with kind of um, taking a more charitable view of Brian's presentation than the title of his book would suggest, because open borders is not, I think, what he's calling for, and he can correct me here, because sometimes he has called for open borders, which is to say national borders are basically just like the county line. It just demarcates who's going to fill the potholes on which side of the line. Other than that, there's no controls, no oversight, no nothing. That's open borders. What other times Brian calls for is what I think I would more accurately describe as unlimited immigration, uh, where we actually do have the whole infrastructure of border control, and we do keep out at least terrorists and people with contagious, deadly diseases and maybe criminals, but we let everybody else in. So just to take out the whole issue of whether terrorists get to get in or not, I want to talk about whether unlimited immigration is a good idea. What, is, what are the issues there? The, the, the basic issue, the basic difference between us, 
is whether foreigners moving to another country, it doesn't matter even where it is, this is a general principle, we're talking about the United States, but it applies everywhere, whether that's a right or a privilege. That's the basic question. Um, can, everywhere, can everybody in the world move here or not? And the, the way I think about it, the way to sort of envision it is, Brian's perspective is that everyone in the world gets to move here if they want, with certain limited exceptions, and he can tell me if he doesn't even want those exceptions, but I'm trying to give the most uh, charitable version of his view. Whereas the opposite view, mine and I think pretty much everybody and all national policy on immigration everywhere in the world is based on the principle that no one has a right to move into your country with exceptions that you then make. So everyone gets to come in with a few exceptions of people who are kept out, or no one gets to come in with some exceptions of people who, get to, who are allowed in. Um, what that second perspective, in other words, that there are limits, that the national governments can have limits, whether they're high or low, whatever their nature is, but they can have limits on immigration, Brian describes that quite explicitly and forthrightly as apartheid. Not as a metaphor, but that it actually is global apartheid, is what he calls it. So what he means is that every nation in the world, without exception, every day is engaging in apartheid. That is the, not just the conclusion, but that is the starting point of this perspective. And what that means is that even self-governing people, even people who have democratic systems through their constitutional process, whatever it is they have set up, have no right to keep anyone out who wants to move here and work. That is the starting principle of an open borders or unlimited immigration perspective. And what it represents is a fundamental rejection of nationhood itself, that it's a rejection of the legitimacy of national community, uh, regardless of what immigration level or immigration policy a nation would want to promote. And as a little tangent, there's an irony here that uh, this libertarian immigration policy could only be implemented in the real world by global government using despotic force because no electorate anywhere in the world will vote to have it, what, will vote for what is literally population replacement. And I don't mean this sort of idea, replacement theory that people on both sides either support or denigrate, but we're talking literal replacement of the population through unlimited immigration. Now, um, Brian, like in his comic book and other and elsewhere, and other supporters of unlimited immigration, point to trillions of dollars of extra global output that would result from unlimited immigration. The Ur document is a paper by Michael Clemens, who also is a cartoon in the in the book and uh, better looking than me, but that's beside the point. Um, that it would double global output. In other words, the GDP, it's not D, it's not domestic, but the global economy would double in size if, unlim if unlimited immigration were permitted. The problem is one of the assumptions, or the basic assumption of this approach is that everyone in the developing world will move to the developed world. Almost everybody, there would be nobody left. What that would mean for the United States is something like two billion people would move to the United States. Um, uh, I asked Brian about this once at some other event we were at, and his response was, well, they wouldn't all move at once. That's when I said that if there were any donors in the audience, they should contribute to sending Brian on a speaking tour because he would delegitimize open borders, and I still think that's a good idea. He made fun of me in the book on that, but I, I still think that's correct. Um, because essentially, and this is a point Brian makes in the book, is that everybody in the global south should move to the global north. That really is 
a kind of magic dirt theory, even though he denies it. Now, put aside, uh, put to one side that that kind of population replacement the ins would essentially wash away the institutions that create that increased output, that increased productivity that people who move here enjoy. In other words, it's not scalable. Uh, it is, it is a, uh, it's a reach to say that because we take in a tiny percentage of our population, which in my opinion is still too high, but a tiny percentage of our population each year, and that they experience higher incomes, that that is essentially infinitely scalable, or at least scalable unto, until everybody moves here. In past centuries, uh, as Brian pointed out, we did not have any formal caps on immigration. There were no numerical caps until uh, 100 more, a little more than 100 years ago. It was 100 years ago. Before that, there were some other restrictions we put on immigration. But before that, we really did have essentially unlimited immigration on paper. Uh, however, our immigration was, in fact, limited. It was limited by the oceans. Technology, both for communications and transportation, made it virtually impossible for uh, most of the world's people to get here or to get anywhere in the developed world. Communications technology was so primitive, people didn't, I mean, didn't even know what was happening 200 miles upriver, let alone what was going on on the other side of the world. And transportation technology, obviously, made coming to the United States or coming anywhere, really, a very long, expensive, unpleasant process. Today, information is instantaneous. Everyone I've ever met or encountered in any third world country has some kind of smartphone. Each of you has the entirety of human knowledge in your pocket. And there is no point anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the developed world that's more than a few hours away from every place else in the world. Uh, so we did have limits that were imposed. Those limits are, do not exist in any meaningful sense. There are speed bumps now instead of the Grand Canyon. Now Gallup, now what does that mean? Does it, so who would move here? Well, Gallup surveyed people in Latin America and they found that about 10% of respondents said they would move permanently to the United States if they could. Obviously, those are all adults. They're not counting their kids. If you account, say, the, you know, roughly similar number of kids that would come with them, that means something like 140 million people would move to the United States just from one part of the globe. Brian is right. It wouldn't happen right away, but it would happen pretty quickly. Uh, and this isn't merely theoretical. This isn't a result of some, you know, just a Gallup poll. Our legal immigration system does, in fact, limit immigration to the United States. A lot of Brian's allies actually deny that that's the case, not because they disagree with his goals, but they say, look, there's nothing you can do about immigration. It's like the tides or the continental drift, and you might as well lie back and pretend to enjoy it. No policy can have any effect on the number of immigrants coming here. But Brian is correct that that perspective is wrong. Uh, we do, in fact, our limits are, in my opinion, too high, but they're real and they are effective. We take about a million, we give about a million green cards a year. Well, because of our immigration limits, there are something like four million people on the waiting list for getting a green card. And most, well, a lot, probably most of those people are not already here. Some of them are already here on some other kind of visa, but most of them aren't. The only reason there's only 4 million people on the waiting list for green cards is that is precisely because of these waiting lists and the amount of time it takes. Sometimes some of them could be decades long waits, usually not that long, but they are long. There's paperwork involved. There's red tape involved. Uh, it's a stupid way to limit immigration uh, using um, red tape and wait lists, but nonetheless, it does limit immigration. Without those limiting factors, the numbers would be dramatically higher than they already are. And the Biden administration has run a kind of social experiment on this issue by permitting, at least until last week, de facto unlimited immigration from Venezuela. In 2020, 
The number of Venezuelans apprehended at the southern border per month was only about 400. By 2022, 14,000 each month. And this is because the Biden administration explicitly exempted Venezuelans from what's called Title 42. It's uh, details I can talk to you until you're, uh, you know, until you're blue, until I'm blue in the face about it later if you want. But what it means is it's an authority that allows the Border Patrol to bounce people right back across the border into Mexico. No hearings, no asylum, no nothing. They just send you back. When the Biden administration announced that it would not apply this policy to Venezuelans, in other words, every Venezuelan who walked across the U.S. border, turned himself into a Border Patrol agent, would get a piece of paper and be let go. It was, in fact, a social experiment on de facto unlimited immigration. The numbers exploded. And in fact, the, it was, the numbers were getting so out of control, the administration, uh, you know, staring at potential political uh, Armageddon in a few weeks, yanked last week the policy of the unlimited immigration policy for Venezuelans, most of whom were not coming from Venezuela anyway, they were already in Colombia or Peru, but the point is it applied to them, and the flow has stopped. Controls work, when controls are lifted, the numbers uh, grow immediately, wildfire-like. Um, the, so what is the, what's the point though of limits on immigration? This is mostly what Brian was talking about, kind of dancing around the moral argument that every nation in the world is practicing apartheid. Uh, the, the point of borders in general, national borders, and of immigration policy using those borders, in a word, is protection. The point of uh, a national community, among other things, is to protect the members of that community. This applies, obviously, in kind of national defense kind of uh, arena, but also in a number of other arenas. And uh, this is why Brian was describing a little, mostly accurately, my position on this, and my position, the donuts thing, which my um, editor made me take out of my book, so I always bring it up just to kind of stick it to her. Uh, Bernadette, if you're listening, this is for you. Um, is that immigrants today and immigrants 100 years ago and immigrants 200 years ago aren't really that different. That's kind of the point. That's the donuts point. It's that, the, that you can eat donuts at your age. At my age, I really should not be eating donuts. And I don't, generally speaking. I mean, home, I may look like Homer Simpson, but I'm not quite that bad. Um, because what's changed? And in fact, okay, the nation, you said the nation isn't a body, but it kind of is a an organism, if you will, because it's not just, we're not just a market that happens to exist within certain geographic boundaries. We're a national community that has developed over centuries based on development from previous centuries in previous places, and we have matured as a nation uh, in a whole variety of ways. We have a post-industrial knowledge-based economy where low-skilled workers still get a job, they still work, this is not an issue of uh, laziness, but they, and their children do better than the immigrants themselves, but they're starting much farther behind the broader community than ever in the past. When my grandfather came here from the town of Akisad in western Turkey, there was horse manure in the streets where he came from, and he came to Boston and there was horse manure in the streets. Things, the things weren't that different. They were different, but they weren't that different. What we're seeing now is a much wider gap between the places most immigrants come from and the United States. Um, government services. Um, Brian's the only libertarian I've encountered who is uh, willing to uh, badmouth Mark Milton Friedman. Um, and in fact, in his book, he goes on, says, Milton, you're wrong, etc. But the basic point doesn't go away that we have now a welfare state in a way that we did not in the past. And that has costs. It is not a cost-free thing, as many on the left 
want to claim that it's just an investment and it doesn't actually cost anything. Uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And we are taking large numbers of people, many of whom will end up using government services. About half of households headed by immigrants use at least one federal welfare program. This is, not be, this is not a moral critique. And it's not because the immigrants are sitting in, you know, Montevideo rubbing their hands together saying, I want to get myself some of those EBT cards. Uh-uh. Immigrants are disproportionately less skilled, which means they earn less money, which means they pay less in taxes and are more, like, more eligible for government services. And even at higher levels of education, immigrants are dramatically more likely to be using welfare programs than the native born with the same level of education. None of this, again, is a moral critique, but we have changed, our society has changed. And uh, you know, one point I wanted to make on the welfare thing, and I'll just make one other quick point and then we'll start abusing each other, is that um, many libertarians I've spoken to who have Brian's perspective see mass immigration as a means of destroying the welfare state. That's the point, or one, part of the point, of promoting immigration. You guys probably, has anybody heard of the cloward Piven strategy here? You would study, there were two sociologists in the 60s who essentially argued for overwhelming the welfare system uh, so as to destroy it and force the federal government to somehow come up with anti-poverty policies. This was sort of a little bit of an underpants gnome kind of approach to uh, dealing with the poor. Nonetheless, the whole point of it was to overwhelm the system and destroy it to result in positive change. Well, this is, those guys were leftists. This is essentially the libertarian version of the cloward piven strategy for welfare. High use, import large numbers of people who are eligible for government services so as to destroy the welfare system. And last point I wanted to bring up is on assimilation. We can talk about this a little more afterwards, but I just want to make the point that assimilation is more than just learning English. Uh, I mean, I didn't speak English until I went to kindergarten myself. Um, uh, and yes, people all over the world are learning English, but there's more to assimilation than learning English, getting a job, and driving on the right side of the road. And again, along with that sort of to follow along with that donut idea, today's immigrants aren't that different. We're different. It's not just the technological difference that Brian referred to, and that's a real thing. You can now live in two countries in a, at the same time in a way that simply wasn't possible before. But it's also a loss of self-confidence on the part of our own leadership class. So that when my mother, who's the daughter of immigrants, went to Medford, Massachusetts public schools, her parents made the unspoken deal, we're gonna take her to church, teach her how to work in the grocery store, all that stuff. You all, Mr. School, have to teach her what it is to be an American. Honduran mom who's taken her kid to the LA Unified School District is making exactly the same uh, statement implicitly um, and those, uh, her daughter is not going to be learning the same thing as my mom did. Some of that's good, but a lot of it's bad. Um, so um, I, I could keep going, but I really shouldn't, so we can start attacking each other. Um, and uh, so my basic point here is, one, nations, nations must have control over immigration, whether it's high levels or low levels, whatever it is, in order to exist as nations. Open borders or unlimited immigration in the moral sense that Brian makes it, rejects the concept of nationhood itself. And that's where, that's why if anybody has any money, we should pay for Brian to speak at other universities. Thank you. So thank you very much for the opening statements. Why don't we structure things this way? Um, uh, Brian, you just heard uh, Mark's statement. Why don't I give you five minutes to respond to his statement? And then Mark, I'll give you about five minutes to respond to anything Brian says or his statement. I'll let you ask then some questions of each other, then we'll turn to the audience. Okay. All right, very good. Uh, so Mark did not rep misrepresent my position. Mark accurately represented what I had to say. Uh, I'm not a politician, so I'm not afraid to say unpopular things. 
I'm not here to tell people what they want to hear. I'm here to tell people what I think is true. I didn't, of course, have time to explain all the unpopular things, I think, which would take <laughs> many hours. Uh, but good news, there's a book with great reviews. People really enjoy reading it, where I do go into all of these unpopular positions. Uh, Mark is right. There is a big difference between saying that everyone has a right to move and just saying we should let them. But it's perfectly fine to go and even say, fine, governments can go and regulate immigration. But should they? Should they just say yes, like I'm advocating, or should they say, hmm, we need to protect ourselves, so no. Uh, this is one where just to get the level of fear down, and like I said, we multiplied the population of the US 80 times between 1789 and today. A very large share of that comes from immigration. Uh, probably a large majority of you are not descended from anyone that originally lived in the US in 1789. So did that destroy the country? Did it destroy our culture? Right. Rather, what happened was mostly assimilation. Right. That's why we're speaking English rather than any of the many languages of all the people that came from all over. Because right, remember, uh, when you talk about Europe as being the developed part of the world in the 19th century, uh, Europe was much more unevenly developed than it is today. So when you're coming from a place like Sicily in 1900, it really would be very much like the third world today, or if you're coming from Eastern Europe or from Southern Europe. Uh, as you might know, this is, in fact, the main thing that was bothering people that led to the original end of open borders in the US, 1921 and 24 was this theory that immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, as well as Jews, were just not capable of culturally assimilating and would mess us up. Uh, of course, since then, we saw that these fears were just wrong. Right? It is just not true that these groups were, had trouble assimilating. In fact, some of them wound up being among the most exceptional in terms of contributions to science, business, and so on. Uh, looking at the, around the room, I think a lot of you are descended from recent immigrants. Uh, there is the question, so how much did your family mess up America and, and mess up our culture, according to Mark? Um, I'm always a bit hazy on this, because it's easy to say everyone so far has been fine, but guess what's going to happen in the future? It's going to be terrible. Um, though I am a fan of radical views, I'm an even bigger fan of the view the best predictor of future performance is past performance. The past performance of letting people into the US has just been fantastic. We really have seen it as a way to take people in desperate poverty, move them immediately to a much better life, and not in a parasitic way where they are sucking the blood from the people that are already there, but rather they work and they contribute, and their kids, of course, assimilate to a high degree and wind up working and contributing more. I uh, was surprised by Mark's original story about Carter and Deng. I mean, uh, Mark is, of course, right that there's no country in the world that listens to me. Uh, it's sad but true. Uh, he's totally right on that. And that's where I'll say, look, Carter was much worse than Mark let on. Carter should have said yes. Yes, let's let in 30 million Chinese. Probably Deng wouldn't have even allowed it. But if he had, what would the US be like today? We would have 30 million more people from, you know, so actually be more, they would have had kids. Right, so, and like, would this be a, would this be a worse country to live in? I just don't see how, rather we're talking about 30 million people and their descendants living a much better life, richer, freer, better in every way, while contributing tremendously to the rest of the US society in all of the ways that Chinese Americans have done ever since. So yeah, Carter was crazy. Of course, not crazy in terms of getting reelected, although guess what? Carter didn't get reelected anyway. He could have let in those 30 million and lost and had the same result in any case. Uh, so worth pointing out. Uh, let's see. Uh, other points? Yes, again, this population replacement. Well, were the original colonists replaced by us or not? I don't even think it's a meaningful question. Right? Possibly if you went back to the people in 1789 and, and fast-forwarded to Dartmouth today, Dartmouth existed in 1789, right? So if you took those people in 1789 at Dartmouth and brought them here today, what would they say? Would they say, oh my god, we've been replaced, this is terrible? Uh, maybe. But if they actually sat and talked to you, they say, oh, actually, in some sense, most of you are not our biological descendants. On the other hand, you're part of this great cultural tradition that we're part of. And furthermore, I think they might look around and say, what's this electricity? What's all this other stuff? I think they would be stunned and amazed by how good things worked out. 
which again probably has a good amount to do with the fact that there are that all these other people were allowed to come. Uh, because remember, you could be a genius in a remote village, and yet what do you contribute to the future of the world? If you just stay in that remote village, probably nothing. Just think about all of the great scientists, business people, that if they'd stayed behind in their home villages in the third world would have wind up contributing almost nothing. They would have been known as an amazing person in their village, but that's it. But the US took in a whole lot of people, and we can look around and see the results, which are quite remarkable. Right, Let's see. Yes. Is up, so I'll okay. All right. I will. All right. I'll stop there. You'll have more time to okay. Um, you can give me the hook when I go on too yeah. long. Yep. The, the one. The one of the important points I want to make is that um, it's sort of twofold. One is immigration was way more tumultuous and problematic in our past than people like to remember. Brian is sort of looking at things through rose-colored glasses. So I mean, it was bad. It means it was a thing that happened, but it had genuinely difficult consequences that because we were a younger nation, we were able to work through problems that are more difficult for us to work through today. And the other point about history is that we have had punctuated immigration in the sense of uh, like punctuated evolution uh, is a concept in that area of study, but we have had punctuated immigration. We had, um, for the size of our population, relatively significant immigration until the French and Indian War. Immigration then essentially stopped until, really until 1848. It, it, it was, we were, immigration was kind of starting to pick up in the 1820s, but it was extraordinarily low. 1848 was the Irish potato famine and the German revolutions, so the revolutions in Europe in general, started about one lifetime's worth of significant immigration, from 1848 to about 1921. That period was, was important. It was very important in shaping the world we live in today, but it was just that one lifetime's worth of immigration that because of a kind of presentism we imagined constitutes the entirety of American history. Then we had about 40 years of very little immigration. From, the, from almost 50 years, really, from 1920 to 1970, roughly speaking, which is the period of time that allowed the immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe especially to uh, knit together with the population that was already here. And what we've seen since roughly 1970, although it really didn't pick up until 1990, is another significant wave of immigration. And if we're talking immigration policy rather than whether having limits on immigration is tantamount to apartheid, if we're actually talking about a grown-up real-world debate about what our national immigration policy should be, I think there's a good case to make that it's time for another sort of punctuation with a reduction in immigration for at least a certain period of time to allow this extremely large wave of immigration, which really only can, has one precedent in our history, to sort of work its way, sort of the pig work its way through the python, kind of. Um, the, um, as far as the Deng Xiaoping thing and you know Jimmy Carter should have let in 30 million Chinese, the fact is even the immigration policy we've had with limits for sure, but a kind of fecklessness on the part of our leadership class, an unwillingness to actually enforce the rules that exist, is one of the things that even at that scale has led to multiple political convulsions uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, first, kind of smaller warnings. Pat Buchanan was a warning, was an alarm clock that nobody paid attention to. Then Ross Perot was the next one, a little louder. Then the Tea Party movement was another louder alarm clock, demanding not just on immigration, but immigration was a big part of it, that the policy the leadership class was pursuing was something huge portions of the population did not think was legitimate and didn't like. And ultimately, we ended up with President Trump. Now I'll be up front with you, I voted for the guy. 
I'll vote for him next year, I mean, next time if I have to, although I really, really don't want to. Um, but he is a product of the incremental steps that our leadership class was sort of kind of taking, I don't know if in secret's the word, but without owning up to it, toward what Brian wants. You end up, we end up with, you know, letting in 30 million people. I mean, we wouldn't have 30 million people in the first year, but it could be 10 million. We could easily have 10 million immigrants, new immigrants come in if we have unlimited immigration, 10 times the level we have now, probably more. Result of that would be political earthquakes. And Brian is right that he's not a politician. He's just saying what he thinks is true. That's his job. That's why we have professors. That's why we have libertarians, because they don't have to deal with the real world. But the fact is, if you're putting forward government policy that you are saying the people in charge of government should listen to you and do this, and if they did it, as he said, if we'd let in the 30 million Chinese that Deng Xiaoping wanted to send, we'd all have, you know, uh, it, would all, it would all be great. No, it wouldn't. We would have had something way worse than Trump, way sooner than Trump. Um, in the real world, people talking about policy have to consider actual consequences, not intentions, and have to act prudently rather than the way, frankly, our leadership class has been acting on immigration. And, you know, that said, the imprudence our leadership class has exercised on immigration leading toward the goals that Brian wants have, even in that partial degree, caused political convulsions or contributed significantly to political convulsions in a way that, you know, dialing it up to 11 would dial those convulsions up to 11 as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we can continue to go at it. I think I'll do is ask one question. I'll give you two minutes to respond. And then I'd like to really yeah, turn to the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so my question, uh, and hopefully others would agree this is an important one, is I think there's widespread view that the American immigration system is, is, is flawed, um, is not working well. In two minutes, what would you change or do to fix, quote unquote, fix the American immigration system? Brian. Open borders. If you want to come in, you can come in. Uh, that would be my answer. I mean, like, you know, like people often want to say, well, we got to figure out a way to change the laws without changing the total numbers. No, I want the numbers as high as possible, right? And yes, there are tens of millions of people who want to come, and I would be delighted to see them here. They will have a great life. They will improve our lives. And furthermore, uh, when Mark talks about convulsions, here's my position. This is only on television. This is the kind of thing the media talks about, saying, oh, this is terrible. It's not real life. The media's job is to go and try to keep people in a constant state of panic about every terrible thing. Once in a blue moon, they put their cameras on something that's actually a problem. Most of the time, though, it's just, let's find the worst thing happening in a country of hundreds of millions of people and act like that's reality. So I say that the consequences of these policies that I'm pushing are great. Also, 30 million Chinese living in an American standard of living free of the oppression of the Chinese Communist Party, and doing so by providing useful goods and services to the people that were already here and their descendants. That, I say, is a fantastic gain. And to say, well, there'd be some people complaining about Chinese immigration. Yeah, okay, well, that's like one, one millionth as important as that. So it doesn't even come up as a rounding error, really. Uh, you know, my general critique of Mark is there's just no quantitative work here. There's just turning on the te television or the newspaper and saying, oh my God, people are really upset about this. It was a terrible thing to do. It's like, well, maybe they're wrong. And maybe it really is just the media trying to go and get people terrified about minor problems while ignoring all of the good things that are going on. So anyway, you know, my answer would be you know, green light. Green light, you're welcome here. Come here, make a better life. We're happy to have you. Trump's election, Brexit, the election of what's her name in Italy, uh, these aren't TV shows. These are actual things driven in part or in, or, in, or in entirety by an immigration policy that is trying to move in the direction of what Brian wants. You want more of that, do more immigration. But to answer the question, um, I would not, I'm not for zero immigration, but I am for zero-based budgeting in immigration. A modern, 
post-industrial society that spans a continent, has a third of a billion people, and invented the modern world doesn't actually need any immigration. But, so we start at zero, but which groups of people have such a compelling case for their admission that we let them in anyway? For me, that would be three groups of people. All immigration has three elements, family, skills, and humanitarian. The first, under family, I would let in husbands, wives, and little kids of US citizens. We always let them in. My uh, maternal uh, grandmother came in after the immigration, it's not really a shut off, but after the reduction, she came in in the late 20s because she married my grandfather. But that's a lot of people. That's 350, 400,000 people a year uh, out of the one million roughly that we take in a regular year. Second, skills, skilled immigration, People imagine this as Einstein immigration. Um, Brian is honest enough not to make that argument because even skilled immigration isn't really Einstein immigration. There's a relatively small, humanity doesn't create that many Einsteins in a year. And people who are genuinely the top people on the planet in the human race in particular fields, um, I'm not sure who's against that. Uh, well, there may be some people on my side who are against that, but I'm not. But that's not very many people. Let's just say, just to pick a very generous number, 25,000 people for skills. And then humanitarian immigration, which I've become much more jaundiced, uh, my view has become much more jaundiced about that because um, refugee resettlement, this is refugee and asylum, that sort of thing. Refugee resettlement, in my opinion, is actually immoral on a large scale because we're taking a tiny fraction of people and bringing them here instead of using the same money to uh, extend, re improve refugee conditions for a much larger number of people. We actually spent several months crunching the numbers on this and it tw cost 12 times as much to bring a refugee from the Middle East to the United States as it does to help them where they are, for instance, Syrians in Turkey, for instance. So what our refugee policy really represents almost in its entirety is virtue signaling. We get to feel better because the family that comes at the airport, give the kid the teddy bear, everybody feels good, and it's good for them, don't, don't get me wrong, but nobody talks about the other 11 people that the money we spent on them uh, doesn't help. It's like sending one yacht to pick up one person instead of throwing out 12 life preservers uh, to people. It's simply wrong. So emergency refugee cases, the UN keeps a list of those, is not that many. Uh, it's like 7,000 last year, I think. People who couldn't stay where they are one more second and had nowhere else to go. So you put it all together, you end up with, let's say, 400,000 um, immigrants a year. That's 60% less than we have now. It's not nothing, but it's, a, but it's a significant reduction that will make it easier to uh, sort of knit together the enormous numbers of people we have admitted with our existing population, which itself has real uh, polarizing and divisive facts, uh, forces within it that don't even have anything to do with immigration. But anyway, that's, if I were emperor, that's what I'd be doing. Okay, so let's turn to you. Any questions you have, uh, try to keep them short, either direct them to one of the participants or to both of them. I'll repeat it for the people online since we don't have mics going around. Yes, in back. Yep, no, you, yeah. Um, it's what you're saying, it, it, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of I think what, what I'm getting from you is should lower skilled and higher skilled immigrants be treated similarly? Is that kind of the point you're making?
Well, yeah, I mean, you're essentially like H-1B visa holders, J visas, this kind of thing. These are people, just to clarify, there's various visa programs, they're called non-immigrant visas. Non-immigrant doesn't mean somebody who's born here. Non-immigrant means a foreigner who isn't an immigrant, who's on some kind of foreign student visa, tourist, uh, all tourists from abroad are non-immigrants, anybody who doesn't have a green card, basically. Um, and what we have done is set up this system where there are non-immigrant visa holders, people with H-1B visas, for instance, is a, is a big part of it, who we kind of dangle a green card in front of, but there's numerical limits, so they're living here for years before they get the green card. They're almost kind of, it's a situation of sort of indentured servitude. I don't think there's any excuse for that. Um, but the point is not simply to let all, give all those people green cards, it's to not have these kind of visa programs that are designed intentionally as a way of getting more people into the United States without owning up to the fact that it's increasing immigration. It's, it's, it's in, a fair, in a sense sort of unfair to the people who are in limbo, but it's also a means for the folks who agree with Brian to kind of get more, to increase immigration kind of through the side door. So uh, I, I think I don't. I think it's a good. I, I don't think it's a good idea. But I think those visa programs shouldn't exist for the most part to, at all. I think Brian would get rid of them too. No categories, right? Uh, yes. Although I'm always happy to get more people in. So I, if the only way to get more people in is to come up with 30 different visa programs, then let's do that. That's my point. <laughs> yes, right here. Right, so the main thing is, of course, by virtue of being here, they're usually a lot better off than they were in their home country already. So the, the marginal gain, there's some economic students here, right? The marginal gain of going from being illegal in the U.S. to legal in the U.S. is smaller than being in Mexico to being legally in the U.S. Uh, but there is research done on what happens when you legalize someone, and the answer is they usually go and get a better job where they contribute more, right? So for example, if you were here illegally, then normally you're doing low-skilled work. If you are actually skilled as a doctor, for example, there's not a lot of illegal doctors that are working in the US. Maybe you could work for the mafia as a mob doctor or something, but no. Normally, if you are here illegally, then you're doing a low-skilled job, which is why you'll sometimes see someone who is an immigrant who does not have papers, who winds up driving a car even though they're capable of doing so much more. So yeah, so basically it means that you give them that work permission and then they're able to suddenly go and become a more productive member of society. Um, so that's the main effect for them. Yeah, it's true. And the only other thing I'd add is that they also then immediately become eligible for a whole slew of new welfare programs because illegal immigrants generally don't get, they collect welfare on behalf of their children but not on their own behalf. Um, Mark said it. Uh, let's go right here and then here and then here. Well, yeah, letting in tons of immigrants is a great way to prevent your population from falling. Uh, it would be enough for any rich country to immediately reverse their falling population, and even if you're Japan, and get your population going up. Uh, I mean, I've heard Mark talk about this before, and he says, well, this is like central planning for population. Why do the people in government think they know what the right number of people is? Uh, I don't think I know what the right number of people is, but I do have a whole book uh, that was mentioned before, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. I have gone over the work on, is another person added to the world a net positive? And I say, yeah, it's great when another baby is born and it's great when we let another person in, even though people are not totally great, right? Everyone, you know, everyone knows a human being that causes problems, right? 
But first question is, is the person's pro are the person's problems so bad that it would be better if they weren't in existence? Right? And then secondly, how many, even if you say yes, like Jeffrey Dahmer, better if he had never been born, right? Everyone's watching that show? Or my 10-year-old daughter watched it while I was away. Anyway, though there are a few people, it wasn't my choice, but anyway, if there are, you know, though there are a few people that bad, there's hardly anyone like that. Almost every person is a big net positive for the world when you really think about it. Even if the person is not your cup of tea, just think, well, there's some other people out there that like them. There's some other people that they interact with. They contribute something to the world with their job. So let's go and focus on that. Basically, I mean, your question is, should we use immigration to reverse the results of dropping fertility? And the fact is, uh, there's a couple of points to make here. One is, it's not a very efficient way to do that because eventually, it's kind of like, remember, um, well, you wouldn't remember, but Margaret Thatcher, the late Prime Minister of Britain, once said the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. Well, the problem with this approach is that you eventually run out of other people's people. Uh, fertility, birth rates have declined everywhere in the world. They only remain high in about, I mean, there's a handful of countries where it hasn't declined, in the Sahel mainly, Niger, Chad, Mali, uh, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, I think. I mean, I may be missing one, but that's it. Every other country in the world has, is already seeing declining fertility. And the, uh, the idea that we should be, that the state should be using immigration as a way to make up for the defects of the people, that, that you know, you frickin' Americans aren't having enough babies, so we're gonna import somebody to do your job for you, uh, is, I find it kind of, offensive, and it also doesn't fix the problem. If there's a problem, if people aren't having children, or maybe aren't having the number of children they would want to have, um, there are reasons for that. There are all kinds of reasons for that, some of which policy has, can't affect. They're cultural um, sicknesses, I would argue. Uh, but there are plenty of things the government can do. There are obstacles created by policy that can be removed. I'm not talking about paying people to have kids, but changing the way we do Social Security, changing all kinds of things. Maybe even, and I'm not sure I like this idea or not, but you know, mandating um, family leave, for instance, is an idea. You fix the problem if there's a problem, and I agree, that's kind of, there, is a, there is a problem there, but you fix the problem, you don't find ways of essentially ignoring the problem. And it's the same thing with, for instance, um, dysfunction in the labor market. There's significant numbers of young workers, young male workers especially, who are just not in the labor market anymore. It's a, the percentage is higher, it probably is higher than it's ever been when you're looking at what they call prime age men. In um, Mexico, they call them ninis, which is neither nor. In other words, they're neither working nor studying. This is a phenomenon that's happening in much of the world Bringing in immigrants basically just sort of pushes them to the side. Here, take your welfare and your fentanyl, and we're going to bring in somebody else to do the work. And I find it offensive that this is something our leadership class is even considering. Yes. Uh, real quick, I just want to point out that if you, can, if you can delay a problem without making it worse, you should always delay the problem. You eliminate this, yeah, yeah. the incentive yes. to address the problem, though. That's the yeah. issue. Again, this is what all medicine is supposed to do. It doesn't stop you from dying eventually, but it delays it. Now, when Mark was saying that we just let in immigrants, but eventually you'll have to face the problem of declining birth rates, remember Mark was talking about getting two billion people here? Yeah, we got a long way to go. We could delay this for centuries. So if there's a problem we can delay for centuries without making it worse in the end, that sounds like a great idea and is not offensive at all. Question here, yep. Yeah, so economics is complicated. That's why we spend years doing it. That's why there's a whole lot of classes. Uh, but the single thing that you really ought to learn in economics, and I hope Doug agrees, uh, is what I said before. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. The best way to think about any economic question is to say, is this increasing production or reducing production? 
If it's increasing production that is raising living standards, it is reducing production, it is reducing living standards. So what we know about immigration is this. We can bring someone in from Haiti who is earning a couple dollars a day, and suddenly they are able to earn 20 times that in the US. And why? Because they are producing so much more in the US. Uh, this is really obvious for something like agriculture. If you take someone from a, from a primitive Mexican farm and put him in US agribusiness, he just grows way more food because the system is designed to use his skills much more effectively. It's also very clear for something like manufacturing. You can be doing primitive home production or be working in a modern factory. You move the immigrant from a poor country, rich country, and you enrich the world. Notice, I'm not just saying the obvious thing, which is that when our population's higher, we produce more. I'm saying the combined production of the sending country and the receiving country go up because people are so much more productive in the receiving country. Uh, now, for services, it's a little bit harder to see where the greater production is, like how is Shining Shoes in Miami more productive than Shining Shoes in Port-au-Prince? Uh, but the answer is the point of a service is to save time. And when you save the time of someone with a higher wage, you are saving more valuable time. So yeah, if you save five minutes of Bill Gates' time, that's way better for the world than saving five minutes of my time, because Bill does better stuff with his time than I do. So yeah, so the basic economic effect of immigration is moving people from where their productivity is low to where it's high, which obviously benefits them, and I think Mark's on board with that, uh, which is good, since I have met anti-immigration people who try to claim that immigration is bad for the immigrant and that it's just terrible, and, and it's like, no, wrong, it's great for them, not perfect, but a big improvement. But again, the main thing to remember is who do they sell the stuff that they make to? They sell it to the people that are already here and then we get to enjoy it. Right? You know, is Amazon good for the economy? Yeah, because they produce tons of stuff and they sell it to us at cheap prices. It's fantastic for the economy. Immigrants are like Amazon writ large. The, um, just to address the save time argument, the services save you time. Well, there's um, one of uh, Brian's allies years ago used to say, you know, she was working for the landscaping industry, I think. So she said, among other people, she said, um, if the doctor doesn't have to mow his own lawn, he hires an immigrant to do it, that frees up his time. You know, I'm sorry, but the doctor isn't going to be operating on that many more people if he's not mowing his own lawn. There's, a, there's even a sort of, in my opinion, kind of a moral issue there. It's like, you should really be mowing your own freaking lawn. You know what I mean? I mean, there's the, what immigration can do, especially with regard to services, is it, in a lot of situations, creates a kind of master-servant society. And if you want to find some place with enormous numbers or enormous percentage of immigrant compared to the native population, look at Kuwait and Bahrain and Qatar and the UAE. Those are not places we should be emulating at all. Now, the general question about immigration, the National Academy of Sciences report that Brian uh, referred to actually um, gave a good uh, sort of a way to think about this. And they, they concluded the numbers are old, and I'm giving rough versions, but the concept is the same. They concluded that immigration creates something like a $50 billion net benefit to the United States. So that sounds like a lot. I mean, I'd take half that and never speak in public again if uh, Brian could arrange that. Um, but in the size of our economy, it's not very much. But more important than that is that it masks a kind of reverse Robin Hood effect where the people who use immigrant labor experience a $550 billion benefit. Again, the numbers are rough and they're old at this point, but that's the idea. But those who compete with immigrants experience a $500 billion loss. So you subtract the 500 from the 550, you have 50. Um, and the important point, I think, for us when we get beyond uh, economists and think as citizens and as members of our national community is that the people who are losing out, and every policy has winners and losers, but the people who are the losers are those who are most marginal to the labor market. Not just high school dropouts, that's what gets talked about a lot, and it's true. Their labor is worth less, but teenagers starting out in the labor market, ex-cons trying to rebuild their lives, recovering addicts trying to start over again, uh, disabled people who require some more hand-holding and accommodations at work but can still do work, even single moms who maybe have to be home by 3 o'clock when their kids get home from school. And when immigration 
is when, when there's less immigration, every one of those people has more bargaining power in the labor market. Now, the question that um, George Borjas, a Harvard economist on this issue, asks is, who were you rooting for? I'm rooting for the weaker members of our society uh, to the extent we can do so to, to make life a little bit less difficult for them. And this relates to Brian's point about immigrants doing better. Obviously immigrants, why the heck would they come if they weren't doing better? I'm not, I've never even heard anybody who says the immigrants I've heard aren't benefiting. Okay, well, anyway, I've heard people say that the smuggling process is bad and all that, but not that immigration somehow is worse. But think about it. Let's say somebody from the Dominican Republic comes here and, well, let's, let's first think of world prosperity from one to 10. The guy from the DR is say a three because the people at the bottom, the absolute poorest people never migrate, almost never, except through if there's a refugee dislocation, that kind of thing. Regular migrants are always people who are a step or two above from the bottom. So let's say this guy is a three on this 10 scale. And he comes here and he immediately now is a six. He's washing dishes somewhere, he's not making a lot of money, uh, but he's a six, a lot more than he used to. The American who was at a seven, who's competing with him may now come down to a six. The question is, for citizens, whose interests are more important? Is the American who was impoverished somewhat, is that impoverishment worth the dramatic, admittedly dramatic increase in the income of the person who is not a member of your national community? That's a moral question. You can answer it either way. Brian answers it one way, I answer it the other. But it's, it's a question you need to address. We're just out of time, so uh, we, I'm going to do here and then here. I know you, I owe you Should one and then one in the back. Ways. So yes. Can I ask I, one more for Mr. Kaplan? I was just wondering, have you ever considered what the mission will be of the America? It struck me when you were talking about the Reagan administration in America and the change being wonderful. With your open borders perspective, do you consider how you accommodate like, such a large group population of America? Well, I'm thinking like Catalans or at least I mean, if you're talking about what happened in earlier centuries, terrible things were done. It was genocide. Um, it could easily have been done the other way, the right way, where you go and say, hey, we want some land. Can we pay you some money for it? But it wasn't done that way the first time around. In terms of what, what relevance there is now, say barely any. It's not like if we let in a lot of immigrants that we're going to go and take away Indian reservations or anything like that. Maybe Indian reservations will take some money to go and let people live there. But again, like there's so much land that is just unused. The total amount of, of share land uh, in the US owned by the federal and state governments boggles the imagination. It's like 30% of the land. And here's the weird thing. It's actually in the Eastern United States, almost all land is privately owned. Federal and state governments barely own anything east of the Mississippi. It's almost all west. So it's not even like a usual thing where there's the more statist and less statist areas. It's just that we privatized almost all the land in the US in the early area, in the early parts of the US, and we didn't wind up doing it in the West. But uh, basically there's, you know, if you've driven across country, this country is full of space. I'm working on another nonfiction graphic novel on housing regulation. There's also the amazing ability to build up, uh, which is right now heavily regulated, but we have so much room we could fit billions of people here if we felt like it. Question here, and then one in the back. Yep. That gets to my question then. So about housing and employment. So previous era of immigration, let's just did not have liberty, did not have government. We have an Arizona with Holland and Mercedes, which is like Tuesday talked about, like the underbuilt housing market in all these places. And there really is no good solution. The local government has been built down to our young men. So how would bringing in millions of immigrants, how would you, how would that confront the reality of Lindsay and Cohen with these yeah, great question. So here is the best thing about all the horrible regulation that we have of housing. It's very different in different parts of the country. So right now, California is strangling the housing industry. If the whole country had California regulations, God knows what we would do. But fortunately, there's Texas. 
There's, play, there's Oklahoma. There's all kinds of other places that have much less regulation. Even within states, it varies a lot. West Texas is still almost the Wild West. Around Austin, there's more regulation. So the answer is there's still enough lightly regulated areas of the U.S. to house vast numbers of immigrants and where it's not that hard to build stuff. It does mean that places that strangle housing are not going to get the benefits of the immigration. They're not going to get... Um, they, they're not going to get the restaurants, they're not going to get the gardeners who are great and are vital. And the, the idea that it's bad to go and hire someone to mow your lawn? Oh. All right. I just, okay. I, I can't fathom it, Mark. <laughs> it's One very last question up here. Um, uh, for Ryan, uh, what would the evidence or arguments look like to change the mind, even a little bit? Can you tell me exactly what it would take One minute each. <laughs> mm. uh, sorry, you got so distracted by the second question. What's the first one again? <laughs> what would it take to change your mind? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yeah. Nope. Yes. Um, civil war. That's what, that's what would change my mind. Show me countries where you're letting in large number of immigrants and civil war is resulting, and they say, all right, that's different from what I'm talking about. That's not just on the news. Civil war is terrible. It means that everything that I'm talking about is a moot point because you aren't realizing the gains. So yeah, so there are a few countries where immigration plausibly has put them either in civil war or at least pushed them close, so especially in Jordan and in Lebanon. Uh, but when you look at those cases, you see, well, they have a lot of things in common. You need to have a whole lot of people coming from one country. They have to have, a, they have, to have an agenda that is putting you on a course for violence. And so I just say this has barely any relevance to most of the world, but uh, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, once there was a guy on Twitter who said he, you know, said he was predicting civil war and I offered to bet him. And then I said, okay, well, how about let's bet on will there be at least 10,000 people that die in any European country as a result of some kind of the, of the strife? And he said, no, no, we already have a civil war because 100 immigrants committed murders in the European Union. I'm like, oh, so I'm glad we worked that out because... Your, your version of civil war is just absurd hyperbole, and almost anything would count, so good that now we don't have to bet. Let's, how about let's prudently avoid the possible preconditions for civil war? Uh, also, Edmund, Edward Gibbon is unavailable for comment. Um, as far as the deporter-in-chief fairy tale about Obama, uh, the fact is deportations plateaued under Obama. They had risen significantly under both Clinton and W uh, because they had made consistent investments in capacity. When um, Obama took over, that increase stopped. And they actually gimmicked the numbers in order to get that like 2,000 over whatever previous number it was so they could put out a press release. In fact, I actually talked to some of the people on this. They were told, what do we have to do to get the number to be even two people higher than whatever the record was so they can say record deportations. It was a political strategy to try to present Obama as serious on enforcement so that he could get the big, um, it was the Gang of Eight amnesty, it's, you won't remember, but it was a big amnesty through uh, in 2013-14. When it failed, enforcement plummeted. It was a it was just an attempt to look like he was serious on immigration. And Biden is not serious on immigration. He's not going to be deporting anywhere near the number of people. Even Trump did. Trump did deport fewer because the um, sanctuary cities are the main uh, obstacle to it because most deportations are of criminals. When the police arrest somebody for beating his wife or selling drugs or whatever it is, they're reported to the FBI but also DHS. And if they're illegal aliens, they used to pick them up, now they don't. Uh, they can't uh, because sanctuary cities won't allow it and now Biden essentially is creating a sanctuary country. So uh, there's a whole variety of policies that Biden has undone 
if he re-embraced and was committed to real immigration enforcement, yeah, I'd think hard about it. But, you know, if there were less gravity, I could jump higher, too. And neither one of those things is going to happen. Let's thank our uh, debaters. Thank you for coming. And uh, please come down and ask questions if you have further questions.